Um, so what I might start doing is actually just not doing the slides and talking to you all. And I will send the slides around afterwards. Um, so let's get started. Uh, all right, so just show of hands. Um, attacks that happen against companies, right? We, we, we worry about these every day. What percentage of those, attack, of those attacks involve uh, some sort of social engineering uh, component? Just show of hands. Do you think it's 10%, 20%? Actually, just yell some numbers back at me. Uh, 80? All right, 80 percent. I think we, 80 is the upper bound. It's actually 90 percent. Uh, 90 percent of attacks against organizations have some sort of social engineering or phishing component to them. Um, the attack either starts off with a successful phishing, um, uh, a phishing email, um, or it, uh, the attack involves a person doing something they shouldn't do. Um, so at, at Dropbox, we have uh, 500 million users and we uh, hold 500 petabytes of data. So we are an attractive target for all, all types of attacks. Uh, and the way we tackle this problem is we have a very strong um, technical team that's protecting our product, protecting uh, our infrastructure, um, and protecting our users. But we've also stood up teams that uh, basically run offensive security against our, our employees. Uh, we, we have teams that have a ton of insider knowledge who try and go through and uh, um, go, go through our support processes, go through our, um, you know, just targeting our, our, our uh, employees in whatever role they're in to try and get them to do the wrong thing. And, and, and the reason um, we do this is we, we, we know that we can have the strongest um, technical team in the world, uh, and all it takes is one employee down in accounting to do the wrong thing, and something bad happens. Um, a lot of companies focus on their employees internally. A lot of companies focus on their employees uh, and, and their day-to-day -day work. We do that at Dropbox, but what we also do is we target employees based on the role that they're in. So what I'll talk to, to you about today is how we target our employees uh, in, our, uh, in our customer service team. Um, we all have some sort of customer service team stood up uh, in our organizations, and these are uh, these are individuals who, and, and teams who are uh, stood up to make the customer's experience good, to give the customer a good experience, to keep your customers coming back because they're happy with the interactions that they had with your company. And your customer service team is likely the only way that many of your customers interact with, uh, with your company. Um, we have seen customer support fail users uh, very publicly on a number of occasions. We saw it in 2015 when Verizon gave up uh, details on former director of the CIA, um, uh, Brenner's uh, account, and that, that information was then used to leverage access to his personal email account, his AOL account, uh, and confidential classified information was exfiltrated from his personal account. That all happened because Verizon his cell phone provider did not do the right things when it came to protecting his account. It happened because AOL, uh, but their, their processes and their workflows um, meant that there wasn't a, a very high bar that had to be met in order for a password reset to occur. So, so what, we, what, we, what we found is the reason attackers are successful when they, they, they target customer service teams is, um, is two things, insufficient, insufficient security controls and uh, people failing to follow through on, on policy. That sounds very obvious, right? That's, 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 if, you, if you talk to security folks, if you don't follow policy and you don't have the right controls in place, something bad's going to happen, right? But how do you apply that? How do you, how do you t apply that and then test that in a, in a customer service organization? Um, the biggest challenge you have, the biggest challenge we have as security professionals is our, our customer service organization is trained, like I said earlier, is trained to make your customers happy. They are trained to do what it takes to solve a problem for the customer. And so that means as tickets come into the customer service team, they're focusing on this from a satisfaction standpoint. There are a class of, of tickets that, that come in though that should be treated differently. And these are tickets and, and concerns around access to accounts, around unlocking accounts, transferring ownership, um, 2FA lockouts, uh, things like that. 
And so what we've done at Dropbox is we've moved those over to an account security team. It's a team that um, is part of my organization. And, and this is a small team of individuals who look at, these, at, at customer um, support tickets in a very different way. They look at them through the lens of reducing security risk. Every interaction they have, every outcome uh, that they decide on is, is through the lens of um, how much risk does, my, does the action I'm about to take actually carry for our user? And, and so we do a couple of things. We, we, we think like engineers. We, we, do, we, we do threat modeling. We operate in a zero trust environment. We don't trust the people we're talking to. We don't trust um, ever 100% that the person on the other side of that ticket is actually who they say they are. Treat them like an unknown entity because they are. Um, but then you have to have defense in depth, and that's where our pen, our pen testing comes in of, of these humans. We're, we're measuring our def defenses, we're, we're testing our defenses to see does one failure have a catastrophic impact to uh, a, a user's account, or are we able to um, implement controls that mean that one bad decision by a person at Dropbox doesn't lead to account compromise. I really wish you could see these slides. I will send them around afterwards. They're, they're good slides. Um, so, so what our account security team does is they define, they're, they're, we call these the four pillars of, of account security. We define rigorous policies around what actions can be taken when. Um, we verify, but again, we never trust, so verify as much as possible. The more verification you can do of, of, of the user you're interacting with, the uh, lower the risk that someone's spoofing an identity. Self-serve wherever possible, and this is really important for the product security people out there. Enabling your customers to self-serve on an account security uh, issue um, reduces the risk of a person doing the wrong thing at your company. If, you're, if, you, if you build in self-serve recovery uh, options for users, uh, you, 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 you take away that interaction that can be gamed, that, that, that social engineering interaction. And then, like I said, offer multiple layers of, of protection. Um, but but pen, penetration testing is the key to making sure that what you're doing is, is correct. And we, we, do, we use penetration testing to, to do three things. We want to identify uh, bad policy. Policies can be bad. We can have policies in place that make it very difficult for uh, a user to get a good outcome. We can have policies in place that take a non-account security issue and make it an account security issue, or take an account security issue and, make it, and, and give it to the wrong team to resolve. Um, we want to identify training failures. We spend a lot of time trying to teach uh, our, uh, our customer support team and our account security team how to respond to these issues. Um, but we might be training them the wrong way. Uh, we might be telling them to do the wrong thing. Um, and then we want to better prepare our team for attackers. Um, if you go to battle and you've never actually simulated a battle, when the fighting comes to you, you're not going to know how to respond. You won't have the instincts that you need to, to get to a, a good outcome. Um, so we want our team to feel the pressure. We want our team to feel the heat of being uh, attacked. The, what the goal is not to do with this testing, though, is to, is to find fault in someone. Just like, just like when you run pen, pen, pen testing against your, your network or your, your product, your goal is not to shame an engineer into saying, hey, you wrote some really terrible code here. You didn't threat model this the right way, and an attacker could get in. The, the goal is just to improve. And, and so we are very conscious of this is not about the individual who, who, who might fail the test. It's about our processes, it's about our training, and it's about the tools that we're providing to these individuals. So at Dropbox, there's, there's three ways that you can interact with our support team. Um, there's email, there's um, chat, and then there's um, phone calls. You can get on the phone and talk to someone. And each of these channels have different advantages as an attacker. Um, with email, it is just this very transactional. You send an email, someone responds to you. You have a lot of time to do research. You have a lot of time to go as an attacker uh, and, th and craft a response before you, you go back to the support agent. With chat, sorry, with, uh, with, with phone, um, it's, it's immediate. You're on the phone with someone, there's a conversation going, you don't have a lot of time to do research, but you have a lot of time to like, turn up the pressure. You can use this human-to-human -human conversation to start to manipulate the human reactions that agents have as they're on the phone with someone. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. And then there's chat. And chat is almost the best of both worlds because you're, real, you're on a real-time chat with someone. 
but you can, you can still go and do your research before you respond back to them, and at the same time, turn up the, this, this sense of urgency uh, around getting the issue resolved. Um, and, and so we, we looked at those three, um, those three entry points into our support teams, and we, we um, basically crafted our attacks based on the strengths and weaknesses of those, of those different uh, channels. Let's see here. And, and so what, what you do is once you, what you want to do is once you identify the channel that you're going through, once you identify the way you're going to attack, you then have to craft a realistic um, looking uh, support interaction. Uh, the, the most important thing to do is you need to work with something that looks real. At Dropbox, we can, um, we, we've, we've found ways uh, to create accounts that look real. We have, to be very, we have to pay attention to the email addresses we're using. We have to pay attention to the data that's in those accounts, how long those accounts have been a, a, around for, what the activity on those accounts look like. Because if, if our account security team looks at an account and says, huh, this doesn't actually look like a real account, they'll either know we're testing them or they'll think it's some other sort of attack and, and the game's up, right? You need to work with, um, with actual uh, or, or real, looking, real enough looking accounts. Um, you also want to use different social engineering techniques. The different techniques that we, we rely on is you pose as a person in crisis. There's a, there's a good video, um, if, you, if you Google um, vishing, V-I-S-H-I-N-G, it makes the rounds at DEF CON, it makes the rounds at a, a lot of security conferences. There's a video of someone um, sitting next to uh, an account owner, and uh, they call up uh, the cell phone company, they call up the provider, and they own the person's account in about half an hour, just by, by um, having the sound of a crying baby in the background and, and creating crisis um, for, the, for the support agent. The second thing you can do is you can pose as an angry VIP. Um, a lot of people use Dropbox. We have a lot of uh, well-known names who use Dropbox. And getting someone to call up and pretend they are Mark Zuckerberg's assistant. You know, and Mark Zuckerberg is actually a friend of our CEOs. And to say, hey, listen, Drew told me to call. Mark needs to get back in. Um, we need to get this done right away. He's about to leave for Africa. Uh, trying to pose, so now you're posing as an angry VIP and you're creating a crisis situation. Who doesn't want to help Mark Zuckerberg's assistant, right? That person has a very hard job. Um, you also want to stage, uh, kind of, a, like, you want to manipulate uh, emotions as much as possible, right? You want to create a bond with the person you're talking to or the person you're emailing or the person you're chatting with. And you, want to, you want to get them to a point where they have empathy or sympathy for you. You want to try and find common ground. Um, we don't let our support agents use their real names when they're interacting with our customers. And it's not because we want to hide from our customers who our employees are. It's because we don't want that, the person's name to be used for, um, for, for open source intel, right? Uh, if you know who you're talking to on the support team, on the account security team, you can find them, you can find what they're interested in, and you can see, oh, they volunteer at the local ASPCA. In the conversation, you can start talking about, the, 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 you know, as an attacker, oh, I have you know, a bunch of, of dogs that I've rescued. And, and you create kind of trust because you have this shared interest. Um, so you know, using tools at your, at your disposal to try, and, um, to try and create some sort of bond with the support agent. The other thing we warn our employees about is, um, use, is posting information about Dropbox, posting internal information that seems fairly innocuous. We had a 10-year anniversary party last year, um, and, or, or earlier this year, and a bunch of people posted about it. To, they, they, they threw up a tweet, posted to Facebook, um, put it on LinkedIn, and that's something that you can use as an attacker. You can um, you could, you know, basically call up, email, and say, hey, you look at LinkedIn, find a list of Dropbox or see who's connected. Say, hey, do you know uh, Joe over in accounting? Um, he, you know, I'm a friend of his. He said you guys had a great time. I saw the picture of you guys uh, from, from the, you know, the Dropbox anniversary party. Uh, it must have been a lot of fun. Tell me about it. Oh, that's great. Hey, by the way, I'm trying to get back into this account. Um, Joe said you guys could help me, right? And they establish, they try and establish identity by scraping information that's uh, available out there publicly because employees are oversharing about the company. So, and, and since this is being done by Dropboxers, there's a ton of ways that we can game um, our, our support teams by pretending to be someone that we're not because we, we know what's happening at the company. And then finally, um, and this, is, this happens a lot, um, 
straight up bribery, just <laughs> offering <laughs> money. Um, and it, it's not always bribery. One of the things that people do with Dropbox accounts, interestingly enough, is they store um, their, their Bitcoin keys in, in Dropbox. And we know um, that attackers are actively trying to, I, I don't know what the estimated value of all these Bitcoin keys are, but there's a ton of, of cash that you can get to if you can compromise Dropbox accounts. And we've had emails come in saying, hey, I had this account 10 years ago. I put it, you know, I had bought like a Bitcoin and I put the key in my Dropbox account and now I'm locked out. If you, I think it's worth about a million dollars right now. If you can help me, I'm happy to pay a reward. I can give you like, you know, I can give you a couple thousand dollars to help me unlock this. Um, and, and it turned out that that was actually an attack. That was not, um, that was not a legitimate request. Some, somehow the attacker found out that this person they were targeting had you know, their keys in Dropbox, and they were trying to get access to the keys. Um, so yeah, bribery, it, it's, it's tried and tested and sometimes works. Um, so you launch the attack, you, you, you start um, pushing, and what you wanna do is as you, as, you, as you push through the account security team, so first you have to start with our customer service team, and you have to say the right things to get them to escalate you to the account security team. And the reason they have to escalate uh, comes back to what I talked about earlier, which is having the right controls in place. We do, not let our, we do not enable our customer support teams to take actions that we call account security actions on, um, on user accounts. The customer service team, if they get to the end of their process maps and they find that, okay, this is now an account security issue, they have to send it over to the account security team. So that's, the, that's, that's one layer of, of defense right there, just not allowing the wrong people to do the wrong things. Look at your support tools. Look, at, um, look at, at, the, at the different ways things could go wrong if, if a person who doesn't understand what they're doing takes an action for a customer. The second thing that we do is we actually have layers within account security. Again, we, we wanna limit what our tier two and three, tier three and tier four agents can do. If you, if, as, you, as you work your way up, there has to be friction along the way. There has to be um, an opportunity to detect that something bad is happening. So, so as an attacker, what you wanna do is game each one of these. So you get to customer support, you want to know the right words to say to get yourself escalated. Hey, I need a password reset. That'll get you right up to account security. Okay, someone needs a password reset. They, they, they can't get password resets to their email for whatever reason. Um, and at each stage, you want to try and get the agent to verify as little as possible. So you want to know what the right words are to say, the right things to say to get the agents to not verify you again. At Dropbox, one of the things we found was re-verification is one of the best ways to, um, to, to Find an, just, just to find an attacker. Get them to verify with, at, at every step. Even if they've done it before, even if the user gets frustrated, have them, have them re-verify their information so that it, it, you, know, you have an opportunity to catch them um, tripping up. Uh, and then the, the, the last thing you wanna do is um, audit. You wanna extensively audit what your account security teams do. Audit is, is, is our last line of defense. We can go back and, and very quickly take corrective action if we see that someone's done the wrong, th the, 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 um, the wrong thing or, or taken action on the wrong account. Um, and, and so what we'll do then is we'll, we'll go through a flow. We will go through um, a, a pen testing flow. And at each stage, we'll identify gaps that, that we found. And when you identify those gaps, we enumerate them as, as a list of bugs, basically. We treat them like bugs. Uh, we, we, we classify um, how uh, severe the bug is. Um, we may call a, um, an incident if we, find, if we find that someone was able to navigate successfully through the support team and have action taken on an account. Um, and, and we measure ourselves. We have, we have uh, KPIs that we use to measure how well we're doing with, uh, with protecting these accounts. Um, and so as an attacker, you really w do want to think like a red team. You want to go and grab as much information as you can. You want to um, come at the customer support team in the most, with, with, the, with, with, with the most believable yet complex things to fix so that the support team is doing things that they don't normally do. They're taking actions they don't normally take. They don't have a muscle memory on how to defend against these attacks. And over time, you hopefully build up that, that muscle memory. Um, so once you identify the problem, what do you do, right? So you've gone in, you've tested your, 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 um, your support team, you had these lists of bugs, what do you do? Um, this is where root cause analysis is, just like with, with, uh, with a technical failure, you wanna start applying root cause analysis to, to where your support teams failed. Um, 
And once you've done the root cause analysis, you want to go back and you want to test again and again and again with the same issue and see, did, your mitigate, did the mitigations you put in place actually resolve this issue? Or are your, uh, are your agents failing uh, uh, at some other step in the process? Are they failing for other reasons? Is, is, the, is the bug that you found still exploitable in a, in a different way? We, and so one of the examples I, I can share uh, is pin verification. When you contact Dropbox and you have a Dropbox for business team, we pop up a pin on, on your screen to verify that you are logged into the Dropbox account, you are a team admin, and you're authorized to talk to Dropbox on behalf of, uh, of that team. And what we found was we were doing pin verification ma uh, manually. The numbers would be read back to uh, the account security agent, and the account security agent would read them off of a screen and see if they matched. And what we found was, in, in many instances, the account security agents were hearing what they were reading. And it, it was like, no, they weren't being lazy, they weren't being um, uh, dishonest. They were just hearing what they were reading. They were looking at a string of numbers on their screen, and regardless of what the caller said, or they, they, they heard those numbers. And, and we realized we need to take corrective action here, so we filed it as a bug. Um, and we got our engineers looped in, and we explained to them, um, our product security engineers, this, this, is, the, this is the route that, the attack, that we were able to exploit. Um, what, are your, what are your good thoughts on uh, how, can we, how can we not use this as an exploitable path? And we ended up moving over to using um, push confirmation. So we got rid of pins, moved over to push confirmation. So now if you are calling support uh, and we need you to verify who you are, you ha you, you'll get a pop-up on your mobile app and you have to verify yes or no, this is me. Um, and, and, and now we've gone from a failure rate that was around uh, 40% um, to close to zero failures. Now, now the big issue is, is someone being fished um, with that pop-up. Is someone just tapping yes when that pop-up occurs? We, that, that's a problem. Um, but that, that's a great example of, of how you, you find an issue, you get multiple teams involved, you resolve the issue, and then and we went back and started testing again. Now that we're not using pin verification, what happens with, um, with verification? How much time do we have left? Just do a quick time check. Oh, cool. All right. Um, so, so what we found is that when you are, we, we, it, it's, this isn't just about standing up a team to go and pen test your users. This, but, what, what you need to do is um, get your product team involved, get your infrastructure team involved, because you will come up with issues that involve, that, that require technical resolution. So before you go off and try and um, just start running tests against your, your customer support or your account security teams, you need to make sure that your engineering teams are on board and ready to go and ready to triage these, these issues uh, as, um, with, the, with the same level of severity as technical bugs. Um, because if they're not, what you'll end up doing is, is finding a bunch of issues that would best benefit from a technical um, fix but you're not going to be able to do the tech. You won't be able to get the resources to put that technical fix in, face, in place. And what you end up having is just a bunch of policies. And, and one of the things we try and do at Dropbox is not implement policies that aren't backed up by technical controls. Policies are, if you're relying on policy alone, um, you, you have a very high likelihood that your agents or your users will fail, your employees will fail uh, at following policy. Policy requires humans to make a decision. Policies require um, paying attention to details, and policies require, just like I said earlier, when, when the agents were looking at the pin and just hearing what they were reading, not hearing what they were being told, policies um, require the human brain to work in a very consistent uh, way 100% of the time, and our brains just don't work that way. So, so this is not just a, um, a, 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 a human test, right? The response here is not just a policy response you have to come back and back this up with a uh, technical fix. Um, and, and at Dropbox, our, I, I said this earlier, our, our goal is to um, empower our users as much as possible. And that's something that's being distilled out of these tests. As we run through these tests with our, um, with our account security agents, we're seeing that um, the, the, the best way, the absolute best way to avoid these problems in the first place is to allow your, your users to, um, to, to self-serve. We see a number of issues at Dropbox. We see, um, like I said before, 2FA lockouts. We see password resets. Someone sets up a Dropbox account with their school email address or their corporate email address. They leave their company, they graduate from school, and they lose access to their account. Well, why did they lose access to their account? 
Was it because um, they reset their password? Did someone log into their account and reset their password recently? Um, was it because they forgot their password and now can't get the password reset link? Or was it because we did something? Um, one of the things we do at Dropbox is we monitor um, password dumps. We look out and, uh, across um, you know, the, the, the different uh, black markets that are out there. We look at just the different announcements that are being made. And if we see a provider has been popped, we will get our hands on that dump. We will um, run it through a system that we have called Judo. And, uh, and if, if we find a match with an email address, we'll take the plain text password that was dumped and we'll hash it. And if the hashes match your hashed password, we'll know that, that, that you're, you're, you're reusing your password for Dropbox on another site and we'll reset your password. So here you have a situation where a user didn't do anything wrong. Well, I mean, they reused passwords, but they didn't do anything wrong, right? And, and we reset their, um, their, their password, and now they're locked out of their account because they don't have access to their email address anymore, and they can't reset it. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at all of this, and we'll try and determine, well, um, OK, this is an action we took. This user says they're locked out. Um, how can we get them back in? And, and again, what we found was that if, if it's a user making a decision, or sorry, if it's an employee making a decision, they're more likely to get it wrong. Why not enable? our users to, to take action through a logged in instance of Dropbox. If they have the desktop client installed, if they have um, the mobile client installed, or if they're logged into a web session somewhere, that, that, that's a good way to, to verify that they are who they are. Why not leverage that as a self-serve way to get back in, into your account? Um, and, and these are the findings that we've been pulling out of, the, of, of these pen tests. Um, stuff that we would, if we, if, we, if we weren't running these tests against our team, we would never get these insights because we don't interact with Dropbox as, as regular users. We don't see the pain that the users have, um, but we also don't, um, don't know how, uh, how to take advantage of our own policies. We thought of our policies, it's, it's hard. We, we try and do threat modeling, but it's hard to get every um, edge case. Um, and so that's just some of the work we're doing around pen testing. We, do, we, we have an internal phishing program. Um, we, we try and run physical red teams where we get people into buildings to try and get access to sensitive data. There's a whole list of things that we're doing that targets our employees directly um, that, that we feel have to be done in order to have a very comprehensive uh, security, um, uh, well, a defense to the attacks that we're, that we're seeing. And so I encourage all of you, if you're not doing anything with your employees today, um, phishing is a good place to start. Uh, phishing, uh, internal phishing programs are very easy to set up um, and very easy to launch. They give you a ton of data. Um, but, but to just keep going up um, your, you know, keep, keep going up your organization and trying to find different areas of your organization that interact with your customers, your sales team, your customer support team, um, your technical support team, just get, get to them. Start testing them, start seeing how they respond, and, uh, and you'll be happy with the, res with the results, I think. I think I'm, I'm done. Cool. All right, any questions? No? Oh, over here. So, here. so I have to, I'm pretty loud, so I probably don't need the microphone. Oh. So I have to assume that your engineers, so we, with, the, with the pin thing, with the pin thing, so the customer provides the pin, then your customer service agent types in the pin, then somewhere automated on the back end verifies the pin, so your customer service agent never sees the pin. So I kind of have to assume they thought of that. So why did you go with the, the pop-up solution instead? So they, 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 were, they were not typing in. So what was happening was the pin was being generated, right? The customer support was reading back. They were just looking at the pin. They weren't typing it in anywhere. It was, the pin appeared on both sides, and it was supposed to be this like verbal verification. Um, we could have built a system where they typed in the pin, um, but we felt like, well, if we're going to build something, if, why not just have this all done in the touch of one button for our users? so that it's a very um, frictionless process for them to verify identity. Um, pin verification is uh, something we're just trying to move away from in general, where you, where you have to have an interaction, just hit yes. And, 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 and the push verification helps us in a number of other ways, too. Um, it helps us with, um, you, we're moving it over to 2FA, a uh, form of 2FA with Dropbox. Today we support um, U2F, we support um, an authenticator app. Um, we support SMS, but discourage people from using that. Um, eventually, we'd just like to have people be able to use the app for, for push-based uh, 2FA. Cool. Any more questions? 
show of hands, is anyone doing this sort of stuff at their organization? Is anyone launching like pen tests against their, their employees? No. All right. Well, let me know if you have any questions afterwards. I'll be, I'll be around. And, uh, and thanks for sticking around late on a Friday evening.